Uh, well, let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters, all saints and sages, humbly we bow before thee all. Bless us that we may understand thy teachings within and without. We understand and know the power of thy teachings that we can put them to best use in our lives. Om, peace, amen. So last time that I got to join you guys, uh, I talked about the physics of God, which is a, a book I wrote. Um, I think it came out in about 2016-ish. And then the book I wrote after that uh, is called Break Through the Limits of the Brain. Now for spiritual seekers and, and devotees, I probably would have called it something else. I would have called it the physics of spiritual experience or the neuroscience of spiritual experience. Because what I was really trying to do uh, with that book was to uh, talk about and share with people how the brain works both helpfully and not helpfully to help us have spiritual experience. So one way I like to put it to those who I assume share this view with me, if God is omnipresent, if God exists everywhere, if we are a part of God, why don't we know it? Why, why is it so hard to know? And the biggest reason is the brain. So our brain, when we're newly incarnated and um, just learning to function in a physical body, the brain is absolutely essential for us to be able to do that. So we have about 100 billion neurons. And many of those neurons are connected to um, our senses, connected to voluntary um, muscles that we can use. Uh, the vast majority are connected to various um, things that are going on in our body, like the heart, digestion, um, the immune system, and everything else that are basically known as the the autonomic nervous system. And fortunately, otherwise our species would have died out really soon, we don't have any control over the autonomic system except either in the some crossover, like our ability to control the breath rather than have the breath just function without our awareness. Uh, but that's about the only crossover everything else that's going on in the autonomic system is independent of our conscious control, conscious mind, which is great because it does a really good job of doing truly trillions of things simultaneously while we're functioning. Uh, and, and we're really more like a uh, we being the, the, the conscious controller of the body we're much more like the jockey than we are like the horse. You know, we're we're telling the horse to go left or right or fast or slow, but everything that the horse is doing, we have no real control over other than the general direction. And so when we come into a body as, as newborns, we have all those neurons in place 
but we don't have the circuits that we eventually build up over time that allow us to use those voluntary muscles and to understand that sensory input in such a way that we can really be the jockey, that we can really use the body. And very quickly, as a newborn, we start trying to move, right? You know, we're, we're experimenting constantly with trying to move our hands, our arms, to get our fingers to do something, anything. Uh, we stick them in our mouth, we grab things, we touch anything that we can find. Uh, we start to move the, the entire body and eventually in time, we learn to crawl and eventually to walk. We eventually learn to speak and to understand speech. But oddly enough, none of that comes preset with our human body. We have to not only learn it in one sense, we actually have to create circuits in our brain to coordinate it. So what do I mean by a circuit? So every neuron in your brain can put out uh, from one connection to another neuron to as many as 10,000 connections to other neurons. And when we're born, we're very unconnected. Most of our neurons are just uh, doing one thing. And so we can move our index finger, say, which is controlled by, you know, a half a dozen neurons. But that's a long way from being able to spread our hands or make a fist or grasp something. In order for us to do that, we have to very deliberately, very consciously start to do that. And as we do so, connections are made. So the neurons that uh, uh, govern all the fingers start to make connections to individual fingers. And the neurons that uh, help us make a fist also connect to all those fingers and the hands and the muscles in the palm and so forth until we create, without realizing that we're doing it, but eventually we create a very complex circuit in the brain that can involve thousands of neurons interconnecting that allow us to do what seems like a very simple thing, which is just to make a fist. So multiply that times everything that we learn to do and we need to do. We need to be able to touch things and understand what that means. So we involve the sense of touch, we involve the feeling of pressure, and those sensations come in and we build new circuits and new circuits and new circuits. And they say that with infants, there is an explosion of circuits made because we basically didn't have any to begin with. And there are literally millions of connections being made every day by an infant. And those millions of connections gradually connect other uh, collections of circuits, and we start to have the kind of control over the physical body that we're going to have when we become an adult. So for us to function at all in the physical body, we need that function of the brain. We need that ability of the brain to make circuits and then connect circuits with other circuits. Otherwise, we'd be infants for life. Everything that we tried to do would take 100% of our concentration to you know, move that index finger the way we want to move it. We'd literally not be able to do anything. So over time, we create all these circuits that essentially are the foundation of physical habits. And I don't know if you've ever wondered why it would be the case, but I often used to wonder 
why are people's walks so distinctive? You know, I can see somebody walking from behind without knowing who they are, and I can say, oh, that looks like so-and-so's walk. So why is that? The reason is that each one of us figured out how to walk independently of any specific walking template, if you will. And that walking involved hundreds of millions of circuits that we created uniquely. So pretty much everything we do is unique because we figured it out in the way that we figured it out. And it stays with us. These circuits that we create when we're infants and into being young children uh, get built upon. We add to them as more things need to be done in our lives. But essentially, we use them for the rest of our life. These circuits are a foundation for our ability to, to move and talk and walk. So this is extraordinarily wonderful, kind of amazing. If you get into reading about it, it's even more, 10 times more fascinating than what I'm able to convey. But something else happens, which is that we start to have circuits that stimulate our emotions. And so as a child, if we have a positive experience about something, a, a food we like, um, the way somebody gives us a hug, the uh, you know feeling we have of being able to walk and talk, the confidence that gives us, all of these emotional experiences are also turned into circuits. Now, the actual emotion, and I, hopefully I'll get to this before I wrap up, but the actual emotion doesn't occur in the brain, but we have circuits in the brain that connect us to those emotions. And we get invested in those emotions. And as we get older and have a, a, a richer emotional life, we have friends, we fall in love, we uh, strive to do things and succeed or fail. We develop millions of emotional circuits. Now, that by itself is perhaps not a bad thing, but just as the circuits that we create are to, to walk and to talk and to move are helpful shortcuts of something that we would otherwise have to do with our full concentration. These circuits that we build to connect to certain emotional experiences also become shortcuts. And so we gradually develop a tendency to have certain emotional experiences depending on circumstances in our life. And again, that doesn't sound too bad and it can be quite positive if the emotional experiences that we're having are positive. But the same thing can happen when we have negative emotional experiences. We start to build circuits that shortcut us to negative emotional experiences. And by the time we're uh, young adults or you know, in our 20s, certainly, we have created circuits that give us immediate responses across a whole range of emotions. And that sort of becomes our, our life. We also have uh, mental responses to circumstances. And I'm sure all of you have observed this within yourself, but if a certain subject comes up, 
and you know something about it, if you watch carefully, you will notice that there's an immediate tape that starts to play of everything you know about that subject and whether you agree with the person who just said it. And you may keep adding things to that circuit, but there's a lot in that circuit of mental response that happens automatically when the subject is erased. So you've got automatic uh, thought processes, you've got automatic emotional responses to go along with your physical responses. Now, if you've built a good life and you have positive thoughts and positive emotions, then this, this is a good foundation for you. But if you have negative thinking or negative emotions also uh, automatically happening, they tend to keep dragging you into greater and greater awareness of the physical body, of your emotions that are associated with the physical body, or the thoughts that are you know, more closely associated with the physical body. And if that's your starting point, when you make a decision in your life that you wanna seek God, then you have all of these automatic responses that pull you into conscious physical awareness, fighting against what you're trying to do, which is to have non-physical awareness and uh, awareness beyond the physical body, which is what we meditate for. By becoming still, we reduce the uh, number of nerve signals that are bombarding the brain, telling us about what the body is doing, feeling where it's sitting, what it's touching. That's your normal everyday conscious awareness. You need those signals. Otherwise you'll walk into a lot of walls or burn your hand on the stove or who knows what, right? I mean, it's useful. But when you're trying to go beyond the body, it is a distraction, it pulls you away. So you have to learn to develop this habit of being able to sit perfectly still. And the more proficient you get at sitting still, the more those signals that come from the body normally uh, as a steady stream will start to slow down. And that's why you'll have uh, either at the beginning of a meditation or maybe in a particularly deep meditation, you might come out of that experience saying to yourself, wow, it was like my body went away. Or as my wife likes to say, uh, her body lo lost its edges and she just became bigger and bigger, if you will. And that is going to automatically happen when that bombardment of physical stimuli slows down. The brain, there's actually even a region at the top of your brain called the um, orientation awareness area that takes in all those inputs and then kind of puts into your mind's eye view a feeling of where your body is and what it's touching. It's your orientation, it's your physical orientation vis-a-vis -vis all the world around you. And when you meditate um, with stillness, that slows down and can gradually go away, go away altogether where you lose bodily awareness. Now the good news, because that's often difficult to achieve, the good news is the brain does the same thing for you that it did for you to create all these habits of movement, which is it creates circuits that help you become still. So it becomes easier and easier to become still because you're supported by these new circuits that you've been building 
just by doing. All of your circuits happen by doing. Whether that's doing in your mind or in your heart or in your body, all of them come about by choices we make. And we, they may not have been well-informed or wise choices, but they were choices we made and they created all these circuits. So stillness is one thing. Then we run into, when we're trying to meditate, that if we have been having a really strong emotion during the day, let's say we're meditating in the evening, then that emotion tends to bring with it not only the feeling, but a whole host of thoughts associated with that feeling. So if we're feeling, I don't know, um, unappreciated for whatever reason, and we sit down to meditate, there will be a stream of thoughts coming into our mind of justifying why we feel unappreciated. So we have both the feeling and we have the thoughts and the thoughts usually reinforce the feeling. So we feel even more unappreciated. And then we get maybe even deeper thoughts around that subject. And a whole meditation could fly by, right? By us being caught up in that stream of emotion and thought. And this is I, the biggest barrier to why we don't know God all the time and why we're not aware of God all the time is because our brain is very effectively making us aware of lesser realities. And we get caught up in those emotions and it's um, they're compelling. We can get caught up in happiness or we can get caught up in negative things, but either way, they bring with them all these thoughts and they bring with them all these feelings. It can just be thoughts alone, um, most of us have some um, sort of avocation or vocation that fills a large part of our day. And therefore, we think about what we need to do or what happened that day. And new thoughts may come in about what we should do tomorrow. That too um, is very useful. We, we need to have it. But if we can't stop it when we need to, it too keeps us from knowing God. So the brain has, let's just say there's a million circuits. By the time most people are in their 20s, 30s certainly, 99% of those million circuits are involved in your day-to-day uh, -day progress through your life. And they fire automatically when you touch a circumstance that they're associated with. So we can become very automatic creatures. And while I don't believe any of you this would apply to, but it's why Jesus said to Lazarus, let the, be the dead bury their dead. And he was referring to people who had just become so driven completely by these circuits that all of their behavior is automatic and they no longer look for opportunities to change that. They have no desire to change that. They really are automatons. And uh, Yogananda said that he often would not take people into the monastery uh, in LA who were past a certain age because he said they had become psychological antiques, that their, their programming, their circuitry was so set that it would be next to impossible for them to make effective change that they would need to make to really embrace the spiritual path. So that's how powerful your brain is. But as I already said, whatever you do, 
your brain will create circuits to support. So if you meditate regularly at a given time, you will find that when you sit down to meditate, you're ready to relax because your body is signaling the muscles in your body that they should let go. It's time to go within. It's time to stop being so involved in the physical efforts you've been in all day. And it's time to relax. Your emotions will also tend to be triggered toward the joy and happiness, peace of mind, compassion that you've experienced in meditation before. And it's a, it's a positive thing that you want to experience. And that will be triggered when you sit to meditate. And your thoughts will typically turn to higher things, maybe to something you just read about Yogananda. I always find it's very important for me, especially in the morning, uh, that the last thing I do before I go into meditation, wherever I'm in my morning routine, you know, brushing teeth and waking up and all that sort of thing, the last thing I do before I go into meditation is to read something that reminds me and inspires me about God. And uh, because I tend to look at Facebook first thing in the morning, I love the fact that there are so many Ananda centers around the world posting quotes of Yogananda that I can always find one to tune into and think about and read. And then that, that helps me because I go into meditation with all my circuits helping me be still, my circuits helping me look forward to it, and the you know the latest thoughts that I had being you know uplifting ones that take me further into meditation. So your brain is your best friend for that. It's your worst enemy if you have negative habits. You can overcome negative habits. Anyone can. The longer you've had them, the stronger they are, uh, the more challenging it is to overcome them. You can, you should, don't let them, um, you know, be the boss, but don't underestimate them either. I think a lot of times we tend to think that our habit is a, you know, it's a non-physical thing right? Habit is just this kind of ephemeral thing that we carry around in our, maybe our brain, maybe our soul. But our habits are actually physical things as well. And those neural circuits have a long shelf life. So don't underestimate, if you feel like you're making progress, overcoming a habit that you don't no longer want, don't us, underestimate how easy it is for that to reassert itself. I'm sure everyone can nod their head there with a certain degree of their own physical disappointment about how difficult it is to get rid of the habits we don't like. But that's, for me, it was important, it was helpful to realize that it was so hard because it's, you know, if the electricity of my brain fires through it, I want to do it, no matter how negative it is for me. It's compelling and it awakens not only an emotional response, but a mental response. And it can also awaken a, a physical response, you know, that I, I, I get, hungry for the food that I wish I didn't eat because it's no longer good for me, right? So they have power that isn't just ephemeral power, but we can overcome them. You need to think about all these practices that you do, meditation being the very best one to do, but any of the ones that you do to support yourself in a, in a spiritual life, from yoga postures to 
affirmations, to chanting, to reading uplifting books. Realize that you have to keep feeding them to make them into strong circuits that will act that lightning bolt of your brain energy first. Yogananda put it this way, he said, habits are like grooves in the brain. And once you start down that groove in the brain, it's really almost impossible not to go the rest of the way down the groove. So you have to create new grooves. I always love the fact that um, George Harrison used to uh, always give away uh, the autobiography of a yogi to people. He, he kept, he said he just bought them in stacks. And he said, whenever I see anyone who needs regrooving, I give them a copy of the autobiography of a yogi. So make new grooves. And when you make those new grooves and they become stronger than anything else that determines your behavior, determines your emotional and mental responses, then it'll be far easier to feel the connection to the spirit and that you'll feel far more that you are making spiritual progress because it starts to become, um, you just don't have to put as much conscious effort into it happening. You sit down to meditate and instead of it being, which it can be easily, has been for me more times than I'd like to admit, uh, the first part of it is just trying to get over physical restlessness or trying to stop thinking about my job or something else. It's very easy for those things to carry us along. But when you get into a deep development of say devotion and you tune into that first when you meditate, you can find your heart opens, your energy expands and your meditation becomes almost effortless because you've tapped in to that feeling and it's a powerful one, an uplifting one and makes you want more. So our job as devotees, our job as seekers of God is to do everything we can to create positive circuits, to create new grooves. Recognize that that's not just automatic, it's not necessarily simple, that you have to be disciplined, you have to focus on it. But once you do, the reward is tremendous because then it's sort of like, uh, it's momentum building. It's not one step forward and then one step back the next day or one step forward and two steps back the next day. It's more like one step forward today, two steps forward tomorrow, et cetera, because you've generated that uh, ability to channel your energy in that way and be supported by your brain as you do it. So that's probably a good wrap up point. Um, so why don't we open up for questions you guys might have. They don't have to be questions in regard to anything I said just now, but uh, wherever you think I might be able to give you an answer that would be helpful. Thank you so much for that. I've got lots of questions, but we'll um, open it up to the group. Maybe um, in relation to meditation, um, is it good then to check your meditation quite regularly? I mean, obviously, sometimes when you're meditating, you can get even into that habit of of being thoughtful and thinking that it's a, a peaceful thing. Is it good every now and again to you know, recheck your meditation or have your meditation checked or chat it out. Have you got any tips or thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it can be very helpful to 
have someone, maybe multiple someones, but have someone who you feel is a, you know, someone who's meditated longer and perhaps deeper than you to ask them, you know, share things that you wouldn't necessarily share and shouldn't necessarily share with just anyone about what you're experiencing and get their, um, you know, their candid take on what they think about it. Because, you know, when you're, when you're meditating, you're, you're kind of all alone, right? You get feedback in the sense of getting a divine response. It's generally uh, the most confirming thing that you're going in the right direction when you feel a uprush of joy or you feel your heart relax or expand or just feel a sense of well-being and peace. Those are all great indicators that uh, you are doing the right things. But there still may be things that you're doing that are keeping you from having that kind of experience all the time. Or I should throw in here that meditation, I've heard Swami say this, uh, I've heard all my friends who've been meditating, I've been meditating for 50 years. Meditation is not linear. You're going to have periods of time when it goes really well, and you're going to have periods of time when it doesn't go so well. Um, don't expect or worst case, beat yourself up if you're not having good meditations. Don't blame yourself for, you know, just being a not good meditator or whatever might come into your mind. Um, relax and accept that it is going to wax and wane. It's going to come in waves. There are times when you're going to just sit down to meditate and day after day, it's just easy. And you have wonderful meditations. And if you're like me, you start to think, wow, I've got it, finally. <laughs> you know, I, I, I figured it all out. I'm clear sailing from here on in. And after, you know, weeks, days, months, uh, things happen. It's uh, the meditations aren't so easy. And then weeks in, I realized, gosh, I just haven't had those kind of meditations in a long time. But relax and accept that that's part of the process. Um, I can't tell you why exactly it waxes and wanes. Could be your astrology, could be karma. Uh, there's There are a lot of potential reasons why. You could have just gotten distracted. Uh, you could have awakened some emotional uh, tape, you know, that's running in the background that you don't realize is, you know, really affecting you on deep levels. But at any rate, talk to people that you trust about your meditation and share with them, uh, you know, what it is, what you're going through. And they, they can be helpful. Uh, just be candid, they'll be candid. Thank you. That was very helpful. I think so many people can relate to that. And and just for any new meditators, it's also encouraging. <laughs> uh, so we have a few really great questions that have popped in. So I'll read one. This is from Ashwin in Melbourne. How does someone who has childhood trauma and many associated negative neurocircuits work on themselves to have more positive circuits to <clears throat> be able to improve their thoughts and have that out of body experience in the meditations and expand. This is a great question. And I think maybe one of the most important questions to, you know, each one of us will come up with, which is what, what should I be doing to deal with negative, very negative, and sometimes, you know, the worst thing happening in your life. How can I transform them? How can I overcome them? 
you know, I don't want them any longer, but they bedevil me. Uh, they they come into my life all the time, unbidden, unwanted. And I think the most important thing to say here is that you probably can't change them, but you can create new circuits that will be stronger than them. And if you can create new circuits that are stronger than they are, then gradually the, the number of neural connections in the circuits that represents physically those negative habits will wither a bit. Um, I don't want to say that will go away uh, and degrade anytime soon, but they will degrade a bit. And in that degrading, the important thing is there's not as many other circuits likely to trigger them. So there's, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Yogananda's interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita, but one of the parts of it that always fascinated me was at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, there's this almost like a listing of all the warriors that are against Arjuna and all the warriors that are for Arjuna. And the notion that Yogananda puts forward as he interprets it is that we are really like a family of impulses. We're not a single person always making a single decision about what we're gonna do. We have created over time a whole family of these kind of tendencies to behave positively and negatively. And Yogananda said in many different ways in his interpretation of the Gita, that what you really need to do is you need to wake up your occult soldiers in the spine, Yudhisthira, Bhima, Arjuna, etc. Because in so doing, in so waking them up, it empowers all the good family members that you've developed and makes them able to resist the negative family members. So this is another uh, you know, metaphorical way of describing what I've been talking about in terms of the way your brain is wired. But the uh, meaning behind both is that you've got to strengthen and awaken what's positive in order to get rid of, not so much get rid of the negative, but to get rid of your tendency to fall into that negative habit. Because that's really all it is. You know, we are souls, we're none of these things, but we do make choices. And if we make a choice to slide into that negative feeling or negative desire, uh, it will pull us in. It's stronger than our will for the most part. We can with heroic intensity overcome those kind of things, but it can be exhausting if day in and day out, we have to be heroically resisting. Better to put that heroic energy into awaking the positive side of yourself. You can do it methodically as well. Think about you know, what it is. I, I don't uh, know exactly what the childhood trauma was or how it manifested in habitual ways of reacting and feeling, but it would, would be healthy for you to understand the reactive process. What is it that triggers you? You know, what, what circumstance makes you start thinking about it and that makes you start feeling it and then 
you know, you're in its grip again. Because what you can do with that understanding is you can start developing a practice of affirmation. You can think of the affirmation as uh, uh, the, the positive antidote to the negative way it makes you think or the negative way it makes you feel. Now, an affirmation is not like a pill. <laughs> and even, even in Western medicine, the pill doesn't really always just do what it's supposed to do anyway, but it's not a pill. You don't just take your affirmation once and you're done. An affirmation is something that once you decide what it is, find what, you know, think of it as the antidote to a problem you're having. And the antidote to a problem you're having can be a really positive statement. You know, uh, if, if the childhood trauma made you feel that you could never be loved, that no one would ever love you, then the antidote to that is to affirm that God loves me. And in God loving me, everyone can love me or whatever connects for you. You know, read the affirmations that Master wrote, uh, read the affirmations that Swami wrote and find one that is that antidote. And then once you do, say it as often as you can every day for days and days and days and weeks and months, and I'm serious, until you believe what you're saying. Not just once, but you have dwelled on it so much, you've thought about it so much, you've affirmed it so much, then now you believe it to be more true than the negative experience you're trying to antidote. Make sure it's got a big dose of divine help in that affirmation, not just you saying, you know, I am loved, I am well. Say, I am loved, I am well because God loves me and because I am a part of God. Affirm the power as well as the reality of what you want to get to. Affirmations can be extremely effective, but I know of very few people who stay with a single affirmation long enough to reach that point where they really truly believe it. And then once you start believing it, you've created a new circuit. You've been creating a new circuit. But when you really believe it, you create a powerful circuit that connects with other good positive circuits. It is a way of connecting the occult soldiers in your spine of Yudhisthira and Bhima and Arjuna and the others that give you more energy in that direction than you are able to muster on your own. Get the divine power flowing through that feeling as well as your own. Get the aid of all the other positive things that you have going in your life to connect to that. And then you really have to stay with it. Um, just make that affirmation the part of the prayer you start with every morning that you meditate. Make it a, a standout quality that you built in your life. And then those other things won't be triggered as often. You're, you're literally sucking the tendency of your uh, circuits to fire that negative circuit you're sucking them in, you're, they're, they're actually regrowing connections to this new circuit and making it fire when circumstances or somebody says the right thing or you read the right thing or you say the right thing to yourself, it fires that positive circuit. I don't wanna pretend that's easy. If you have significant um, childhood trauma issues, they can be very challenging to meet, you know, the, the energy they have is deeply rooted and strong, but you can, 
do it with God, do it with perseverance, do it until you do it. Fake it until you make it. Keep doing it until you really, really believe it. And then it will, you will be transformed. Thank you. That was excellent. <laughs> Very encouraging. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. This is uh, similar, but also subtly different in the way that we need to work with our brain grooves. So this is from Bhakti in Melbourne. Hi, Puru. Thank you for a great talk about this fascinating subject. Can you speak a little to physiological and psychological conditions such as complex PTSD, PTSD, Alzheimer's, dementia, which are increasingly prevalent in the world and their impact on the neurological and spiritual aspects and how to create new grooves or counteract the impact of these conditions. Thank you. Um, well, Baki, you probably gather that I answered some of that question, but you also asked something that I think might be helpful for people to understand that PTSD is a set of circuits created by trauma that are self-reinforcing. So you have a whole family of triggers that will send you into another circuit which can involve extreme tension, fear, uh, you know, incredible sense of, of uh, loss. And because the initial experience was so powerful, and I know this is true of soldiers, I imagine it's true of children, but with soldiers, they keep reliving it and they can't stop reliving it. And so the very fact that they're reliving it is they're strengthening it. And they can't get out of this loop. There has been, I, I can't necessarily recommend it because I don't, haven't experienced it. I believe it makes sense. But I have heard that soldiers suffering from PTSD who have been um, given uh, hallucinogenic experiences under very close control, it can be the only thing that breaks them out of the loop. That in a way what a hallucinogenic drug does is that it's stops all the routine firing of the brain's circuits. And so you're sort of freed up to go in directions that you wouldn't normally feel free to go in uh, because you don't have all these million and one circuits pulling at you. So with soldiers suffering from PTSD, PTSD I think that breaking that cycle which has just been agonizingly heartbreaking for them for years. Could have been the death of a friend on the battlefield. It could have just been the constant tension. I've talked to people who were on the front lines in Afghanistan and they'd be on patrol night after night, knowing all night, every night, that they could get shot and that would be it. Imagine, I mean, I can't quite imagine it, but try to imagine the fear and tension you'd be carrying along with you all the time. And then that becomes such a strong circuit, they can't get out of the fear and tension. They bring it home from the battlefield, they marriages break up, they can't keep jobs because they're stuck in that. So the same advice I gave before about affirmations and creating new circuits could also work, but in um, extreme cases of PTSD, I'm talking about in particular, this getting uh, help through um, hallucinogenic 
drug therapy could could work for people. I don't know how long lasting it is. That's why I'm not entirely, you know, I'm not a practicing psychologist. It's not something I do and know how to do. So I don't want to recommend it unhesitatingly, but it is interesting that it does help people. But I think ultimately you've got to create the do. Uh, there's just no way around it. You've got to create new circuits. You've got to use your willpower and intention to experience new things. And the single most powerful way to do that is to meditate. Meditation is not only do you experience something new and positive, if you connect to spirit, it's supercharged. It just builds a much more powerful uh, circuit, a much stronger circuit, faster than anything else you can do to, to be positive. So let me just take a quick look at your question. Um, I don't know anything about Alzheimer's and dementia, Lee. I wish I did. I know many, many people who are dealing with that. Um, but I don't, you know, I, it must be a circuit or circuits that don't fire well, but I don't really understand why they don't. There is medical evidence of plaque and what are called tangles, which have to do with the way the nerves don't interact with each other. The, the neurons in the brain don't interact with each other well, but I don't really know the cause and, I, and therefore, I, I don't think I could give you a very good answer. Thank you. That was a great, uh, great answer to that question and to all of those questions. Very encouraging, again, for the importance of meditation and our relationship with the divine so, to be able to change our brain and reprogram ourselves, basically. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, you really have to. I. I if you notice, maybe you notice, I never use the word programming hmm. um, because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, but it comes from the notion that the brain is a computer and that it has programming. But I don't think the brain has any programming. I think what we uh, experience from the brain is a tendency to um, have us act in a certain way but the actual like your mind's eye view you know seeing everything that you see this this compilation of all the sensory input coming from your body i don't think that happens in the physical brain i think that happens in your astral body and i think that your thoughts originate in your astral body and your feelings originate in your astral body and that um there really is no such thing as being programmed like a computer program to do those kind of things. So I stay away from that word. That's great. Great um, explanation. Thank you. It's all been very uh, amazing. I, I feel like I could just sit here for the next few hours, but maybe we should just say, share with the world some of these blessings and send out three arms and really... Uh, I'm sure there's another talk based on the uh, benefits of sharing that energy as well, you know, from a programming perspective, but I won't save that for another time. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's let's uh, really uh, energize our hands and send out three arms and send these beautiful blessings to the group. Oh. Thank you once again, and um, yeah, can't wait to see you soon. <laughs> My pleasure.
figure out something else that I can natter away about and I'm happy to come. Oh, great. We look forward to that. We'll be in touch then. And for uh, anyone, yes. Blessings to you all.